The Nightmare Lands is one of the strangest and most unique domains of Ravenloft. In some ways, it is almost a dimension of its own, with its own demented logic. It is a physical place that exists in the Demiplane of Dread, but it's also partially made out of dreams, or rather, nightmares. But before we can really talk about the Nightmare Lands, we need to understand how dreams, the ethereal plane, and reality interact and work in D&D. Let's begin by briefly talking about the ethereal plane. We don't need to know much about it, but it is important to know how it's laid out. It is divided into three different layers, the Border Ethereal, the Wall of Color, and the Deep Ethereal. The Border Ethereal is what most people think about when it comes to the Ethereal Plane. It exists next to and overlaps with the Material Plane, the plane where our characters usually run around. Many spells interact with it, and it's where ghosts and night tags and such run off to when they hide. Then we have the Wall of Color. This shimmering wall of color is the border that separates the border ethereal from the deep ethereal. The wall looks a lot like a Aurora Borealis, it has no seeming depth and creatures can pass through it easily. In fact, it is impossible to interact with it in any real way. Then we have the last part, the deep ethereal. This is an endless expanse of mist that goes on forever, but hidden deep within the deep ethereal are pocket dimensions, known as demiplanes. And it is here within the deep ethereal that we find the demiplane of dread more commonly referred to as Ravenloft. Its location in the Deep Ethereal is what allows Ravenloft to touch all of the material planes, and in a way it is also what allows for the Nightmare Lands to exist, because what most people don't realize is that the Wall of Color isn't just a marker that separates the border from the Deep Ethereal, it is in fact the Dream Plane. Across near endless material planes, when mortals sleep, a part of them, their dream selves, drift off to the Dream Plane to dream. The important thing to realize here is that the Plane of Dreams is next door to written neighbors to Ravenloft on a cosmic scale, and that will be important later. Now that we know where dreams take place, we also need to talk about the different layers of reality that make up the cosmos. Essentially, there are four types of reality you as a person can be in. There are dreams, dreamscapes, reality or the waking world, and hyperreality. That last one, the fourth layer of reality, has nothing to do with what, the rest of what we're going to be talking about, so let's just get that one out of the way first. In hyperreality, everything is more potent and vivid. Fire burns brighter, pain hurts more, healing heals more, and so on. It is an interesting idea, but not really relevant. Instead, let's talk about the first layer of reality, dreams. Nothing really matters, and everything is possible in dreams. If you can imagine it, it can happen on this level of reality. To move somewhere, you just imagine yourself going there. Nothing can really hurt you at this level of reality, since nothing is truly real. If you die in this level of reality, for instance, you mostly just wake up. Normally, the only way to experience this level of reality is by sleeping and dreaming, but there are a few exceptions. Sometimes a little bit of this layer of reality can seep into the material plane. When this happens, you might almost um, catch something out of the corner of your eye, or a place might just seem a little bit more exciting or magical for a moment, but it's all illusion, nothing can directly interact with you. The second level of reality is dreamscapes. These are still dreams, but dreams with substance. When you're inside of a dreamscape, things are still not completely real, but they can affect you and your real body. Taking damage in a dreamscape can cause lingering psychic or mental damage to a person, and it can even potentially kill them. Dreamscapes do form naturally in the dream plane and appear as bubbles in the wall of color. Even people who study the ethereal plane may never see them, however, since the wall is effectively endless and dreamscapes are rare compared to normal dreams. They are formed when, by a particularly strong, important or vivid dreams, and when the dream ends, so does the dreamscape. They can also be formed by certain entities and spells. When a god speaks to a follower in their dreams, for instance, they do so by creating a dreamscape. Dreamscapes are very, still very malleable, and reality there can be altered and shaped, but it is somewhat harder, and still it's a little more, bit more structured than a regular dream. And then as mentioned, we have the third level of reality, which is the waking world. It's where reality conforms to the rules of D&D, and everything works as you expect it to. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the Nightmare Lands is a rather unique place. Normally, these layers of reality exist separate from each other. You might transition from one to the other, but generally they don't overlap. In the Nightmare Lands, however, the first three levels of reality all coexist and meld into each other. Creating another thing that makes the Nightmare Lands different from most of Ravenloft's domains is that it does not have a single Dark Lord. Instead, it has the Nightmare Court, six unique and powerful evil beings who rule the land together. 
The Nightmare Court all seem to need to feed off nightmares. However, whether it is to survive, or if it's just to fuel their powers, is difficult to say. One thing that is true for the Nightmare Court, however, as it is for all Dark Lords, is that they are trapped in their land. And since they cannot leave, they needed to find a different way to feed off nightmares. The Nightmare Court seem to possess a unique understanding of the true nature of the Demiplane of Dread and the Dream Plane. And so, they seem to have decided that if they cannot go into the Dream Plane, they would bring dreamers to them. Somehow they learned how to create permanent dreamscapes outside of the dream plane, and they constru constructed a powerful magical artifact known as the Web of Dreams. The web is essentially a giant invisible net that passes through the dream plane and entangles anyone who is having nightmares. A dream self caught in the web will start to suffer from recurring nightmares, and can stay in the net for up to six days. If the nightmare being had is delicious enough for the court, then they will pull that person's dream self to the Nightmare Lands and cast it into a dreamscape they control, essentially trapping them there until they can either escape or die. While the person is held there, they are tortured by nightmares each time they sleep in their dreams, and the Nightmare Court collects the energy from for whatever dark purposes they are working on. While a dream self is still caught in the Nightmare Lands, the physical form of a person can go about their lives as normal, although they will slowly start to waste away, finding that each time they dream, they feel a little weaker, until they eventually just slip into a coma and don't wake up one day. Then, not long after, they die. The easiest way, which is not to say that it is easy, but the easiest way is to, to escape is to be by being headstrong, persistent and by fighting back in your dreams every night. If you refuse to give up and keep trying to break out, the Nightmare Court, or at least the servants that are keeping you locked up, will need to expend some of that juicy energy that they're collecting to fuel their abilities to keep you trapped. Eventually, you might start costing more than they're gaining from holding you, upon which your dream self will be let go. But the Nightmare Lance is not just somewhere you can go in your dreams. You can also go there in person, although it might not be a good idea. At one point, the Nightmare Lance was, uh, was somewhere you could easily walk. It was a country to the east of Nova Vasa where in modern times you will instead find the Nocturnal Sea. No one actually seems to remember this being the case, but it does still show up on old maps as having been there. If you want to go there now, you will have to sail into the mists, as the Nightmare Lands is now an island located somewhere out there. To reach it, you merely have to focus on your destination and keep a straight course, and sooner or later you will exit the mists and see the horrid land before you. So let me take you on the, a journey to the center of the Nightmare Lands. The waters around the island are extremely cold and hostile, and filled with shoals and reefs. Jagged rocks stick out of the water, and the remains of ships that have tried to make for land can be seen scattered around the area. Sailing through the shoals and would be hard enough as it is, but the cliffs and rocks don't like to stay still. At times they will move and shift, and if you're really unlucky, a jagged rock could burst out of the water and spear your ship. This is not so much the doing of the Nightmare Court, as I've seen no evidence that they can control the shoals, it's just the effects of the ever-changing nature of the land. In general, you need to pass between three and eight successful rolls to get to land, depending on the weather. If one of those fails, your ship is damaged and will start to sink. You might think then that it would be a better idea to swim to shore, but unfortunately that wouldn't work out very well. The waters are home to undead monsters, nightmare creatures, ravenous sharks and scrags, perhaps better known as sea trolls. Anyone who dies in the shoals rises as a sea zombie, and the shipwrecks are just full of them. Once you make it through the shoals, you can land on the rocky beaches of the island and find yourself in the most stable part of the domain, the Outlands. This barren, rocky wasteland encircles the island and used to be the borderlands towards Nova Vasa. Unlike the rest of the island, things don't change here. Nothing grows, it never rains, it's just grey rock and grey skies. Thunder is a constant companion in the Outlands, and there are occasional lightning strikes, but there's little else here. The occasional monster wanders out here, but since nothing lives out in the Outlands, they rarely stay for long. Dreams do sometimes leak out into the Outlands as well, but they're always first reality dreams and they cannot really affect anything. Anyone seeing them can quite easily see that they're just mere illusions. After the Outlands, the next region you will encounter is the Ring of Dreams. This area is filled with thousands of mist-filled spheres some only a few feet across, others several hundred feet wide. They all hang in the air, from about 5 feet off the ground to 500 feet above the land. 
These are the Nightmare Court's artificial dreamscapes, the prisons they use to hold their victims in. Naturally, some of these spheres can be seen from miles away. The region consists of grassland, but the dream reality radiating from the spheres is so powerful that it is constantly changing the grass underneath them. The grass is constantly swaying and moving, changing in form and color. Those who pass through the Ring of Dreams might be curious to take a peek at the spheres to see what's inside of them, but doing so can be dangerous, as there is a chance that a person looking into a dreamscape is drawn into it. After the Ring of Dreams comes the Forest of Everchange. I would say it is the least stable of any of the regions of the Nightmare Lands. The terrain of the forest constantly shifts and changes, its true form does seem to be that of a forest, as it seems to return to the same basic forest every couple of transformations, but it can just as easily be a mountain, a swamp, or a desert at times. When a forest changes, it does not do so instantly, instead it slowly shifts, often in ways that travelers do not realize anything is changing before it has already happened. You might start walking through the forest in spring bloom, and as you make your way forward, you find the temperature growing slightly colder until you realize that you are stepping in snow, and the whole land around you is now in the depths of winter. The first of the Nightmare Court's members makes his home in the forest, and where he travels he brings the change with him. His name is Morpheus, and he takes the shape of a red-skinned man with dark hair and pointed ears, who, whose lower body tapers off into a trail of vapor. Morpheus loves change and hates order, he feeds off nightmares of chaos and madness. Morpheus has no specific home and wanders the forest as he pleases, but there is an arch within the region that he uses to focus his power, and it's the only thing that never changes. Beyond the forest lies the heart of the Nightmare Lands, the City of Nod, also sometimes called the City of Forgotten Dreams or the Nightmare City. It's a strange and desolate place, a city in ruins that doesn't quite match any known city you've ever seen, but that somehow reminds you of every great city you've ever known. Like much of the Nightmare Lands, the city moves and shifts when you aren't looking. Try to double back where you came from, and you might just find that it's now a dead end. Another peculiar thing about the city is that Sound seems to act inconsistently within it. You might hear someone who whispers a block away as if they stood next to you, while the scream coming from someone a few feet away might sound like it was coming from somewhere far down the street. No one lives in the city, and yet those who spend time in it start to feel like there is someone watching them. Well, that's not entirely true. A couple of creatures make their home here, namely the other lords of the Nightmare Court. First and foremost of the courtiers is the Nightmare Man. The name might seem a little silly, but it is rather appropriate. Very little is known about any of the lords, and most have never given a real name to outsiders, so the Nightmare Man is the closest to a name that he has received. He takes the form of a withered man in a hooded robe who might be mistaken for a monk of some sort. His face is always hidden, and spiders seem to scurry about his robe. He does seem to be the most powerful of the court, and it also seems like he is the one who is cursed and claimed by the mists, and that the rest of the lords were pulled in because of some connection to him. Van Richten actually has a theory that all of the lords are just aspects of one individual's personality or soul, although I'm not sure I would agree. More likely, he was trying to make a, find a way to make the Nightmare Lands fit into his preconceptions of how Ravenloft works. The Nightmare Man does not have a preference when it comes to nightmares. He enjoys all dreams that induce fear equally. He does, however, have an obsession with creativity and imagination, as he seems to lack the, sp a, the spark that allows a person to create anything original. The frustration and anguish he feels around this makes me believe that his attempts to create art are somehow tied to the reason he ended up in Ravenloft. The Nightmare Man makes his home in the Grieving Cathedral. It is a massive ruined cathedral with stained glass windows that constantly shift and change to show the countless horrors being played out in the Ring of Dreams. This cathedral is the true heart of the realm and the source of incredible power. I would say confronting the Nightmare Man here would be somewhat foolish, but strangely enough, those who explore the cathedral very rarely encounter him. He seems to stay away from guests. The next Nightmare Lord is the Ghost Dancer, who makes her home in the Theater of the Macabre. She might be my favorite lord, as she is both terrifying and tragic. The dancer is a ghost, and the only undead amongst the court, who seems to be desperately trying to understand her own death. She is dressed like a ballerina in white, but her dress is stained with bloody red handprints and dark bruises around her neck, not only serve to show how she died, but also seem to have robbed her of her voice. The ghost dancer draws her energy from dreams of guilt and shame, and she definitely seems to have a dramatic flair to her nightmares. 
Like the rest of the city of Nod, her theater is run down and broken, although she still holds performances from time to time. There is even a crowd, although it consists entirely of undead creatures. When the ghost dancer dances, she transfixes all those who see her and her performances have been known to drive people mad. She also uses her dancing to paralyze those she fights before moving in with scimitars to cut them to pieces. Then we have Hypnos. He is often described as being sleep personified, although I'm not entirely sure how literal one should be about that statement. He appears as a sleeping Victorian gentleman trapped inside of a glass coffin. He doesn't really move, but he is able to speak telepathically to those who draw near, and he is a master at hypnosis. Often, when the Nightmare Corps need something done outside of their land, they will send Hypnos into the dreams of someone to hypnotize them and have them do their bidding during the daytime. Hypnos makes his home in the Spire of Sleep, a pale white tower shrouded in mists and surrounded by a moat that causes people to fall asleep. There are no doors or entrances, and if you make your way inside of a tower, it is under a permanent slow spell. Next is Malunga. She is a powerful witch and one of the most sneaky of the Nightmare Court. She loves tricking groups of explorers into bringing her along with the help of her illusions so she can lead them into danger. Malunga feeds on dreams of fears and phobias and loves to scare people. I definitely get the impression that she's sort of the right-hand woman to the Nightmare Man and has her own agenda going on. The rest of the Nightmare Court are all sort of content with just wallowing in nightmares, but Malunga is doing research, creating monsters and plotting... something. She makes her home in the ghettos. The ghettos are a district of sorts within the city. It is also in some ways a living creature. The ghettos appear like a rundown slum, but it actively hunts, moving around the city and trapping intruders. It is filled with monsters, and if it catches you, you're definitely going to have to fight to make it out alive. The last member of the Nightmare Court is the least interesting in my opinion. It is the Rainbow Serpent. Like the name implies, he's a very colorful flying snake. When I first read about it many years ago, I thought it could be a evil quattle, but once I got a hold of the books, I realized that it was only 4 feet long and seemed much more like it was just an awakened flying snake. The Rainbow Serpent loves paranoia and feeds off the dreams of those who are afraid of being betrayed or those who have just been betrayed. It makes its home in the Park Primeval, one of the few areas of the city that has signs that mark its name. The park is completely overgrown and filled with dangerous beasts, especially snakes. At its center stands a massive ruined tree called the Tree of Suspicion that acts as the Rainbow Serpent's home and the focus for its power. More beings make their home in the Nightmare Lands than just the Nightmare Court, however. Fears and other dream creatures known outside of Ravenloft are common. And there's also a few rarer types of dream creatures that normally do not stray out of the dream plane. There are the Dream Weavers, tiny spiders who spin the landscapes of dreamscapes. They do come in two forms, depending on whether they spin dreams or nightmares, and they are mostly harmless background workers, and you probably would never know they're there. Then there are the Dream Spawn. There are a couple of different kinds of Dream Spawn. Basically, lesser Dream Spawn serve as the props and background actors in dreams. If you're trapped in a dreamscape and you encounter a person from your past, or you see a farmer being eaten by a dragon, then those are likely all Dream Spawn. Greater Dreamspawn are more powerful and play the most important roles. They usually serve as the directors of dreams and nightmares, but also take on the role of actor when playing out the main antagonist or other vital characters. While the lesser Dreamspawn are just doing their job, Greater Dreamspawn in the Nightmare Lands are far more intelligent and clever and generally follow the Nightmare Court willingly and take as much pleasure from torturing their victims as the Court does. There are also a few creatures that are native to the domain they're not found elsewhere. The first of these are the uh, the arcane heads. These are created by Malunga from the severed heads of explorers who have been slain on the island. They fly around in swarms and search for intruders that can be captured and used in Malunga's experiments or in the dreamscapes. When they find intruders, they will open a portal and summon their mistress so that she can capture them. Disturbingly, uh, arcane heads need to eat the meat of physical creatures to survive, and Often they hunt and eat other, the other unique creature that makes its home here, namely the Lost Souls. Contrary to its name, Lost Souls are closer to a form of zombie than a ghost. The ambient magic in the domain is so high that the corpse of anyone who dies here will eventually animate and rise up as an undead creature. These Lost Souls have a strong urge to seek out others of its kind, and when it finds them, the two merge and become one larger, more terrifying creature. 
up to eight corpses can merge into one lost soul, and it becomes this rolling torrent of rotting limbs and moaning faces that claws its way through the land. Their AC, chance to hit, hit points and attacks all go up as more and more of them merge together, and I can tell you that a maxed out lost soul is a terrifying creature capable of taking down a whole group of experienced adventurers. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the Abernomads. They're the only native people of the land. Abernomads live a simple hunter-gatherer existence in the forest of Everchange. No one seems to know where they came from or how long they've been in the domain. Perhaps they are the descendants of travelers who got lost in the domain, or they could be the original inhabitants of the city of Nod, who were drawn into Ravenloft when the Nightmare Man and his city were claimed by the mists. The Abernomads certainly don't know nor do they seem to care. They had to adapt to survive in the land, and one thing they learned is that the more you understand about the land, and the more questions you ask, the more dangerous it is. The Nightmare Lord seem to occasionally target those who seek to understand the land, and so, those individuals are cast out of the tribes and left to wander alone. Through study of the land, those individuals become shamans, and they do gain some measure of power from it and are able to cast some spells. The Nomads adapted in other ways as well. For one, they do not dream, and so they're not really of interest to the Nightmare Lords. They also embrace that the world around them changes constantly and cannot be relied on. According to the Aber Nomads, only what they can see right now in front of them exists. If you walk away from them, in their minds, you literally cease to exist. They are peculiar and mysterious people. Aber Shamans also carry dream catchers, magical staves that protect them from the effects of the land. Interestingly enough, they are the, one of the only ways you can reliably leave Ravenloft. Every dreamscape has an exit portal that connects the dreamscape to the dream plane. The portal does not have to lead out to the Nightmare Lands again. Instead, it can take you anywhere. If you focus your mind hard enough, it can even take you outside of Ravenloft. A Dreamcatcher allows its wielder more easily to focus the portal so that they can choose their destination. Abershamans, however, cannot use the portals to leave the Nightmare Lands. It would almost seem like the Abernomads are also cursed and trapped just like their Dark Lord. With that, this year's Ravenloft month comes to an end. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, there will always be next year. And as always, thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed this look at one of the most unique domains of Ravenloft, then please, like this video. And don't forget to press the bell icon if you subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. If you want to support the channel, then please share this video on social media, it really helps out a lot. And you can also follow me on Tumblr or Twitter or check out my DM Skill page. Links to all of those below. Until next time, Dungeon Delvers.